So what I've learned from you today is just say yes. Say yes to opportunities. To more things for sure. Yeah. yeah. If uh, And expand your comfort zone. Do one thing every day that like, you know, is a little bit outside of your comfort zone. Talk to a stranger, whatever the thing is. Uh, maybe that's not a great one if you're a kid and don't talk to strangers or whatever, but you know, do it safely. You know, where like live life, put the, put the bowling alley bumpers down for like, you know, one frame or something like that and see what happens. Welcome to Gratitude Geek, the relationship marketing podcast for solopreneurs building genuine, lasting relationships with clients, colleagues, and community. I'm your host, Candice Rodardi, and today we are joined by the world's number one failure, Ben Courier. Ben, aka the failure guy, is an Excel expert, podcast host, and public speaker. He was fired from every job after college, but he has found success by sharing his stories of failure with others. His podcast reaches a global audience and ranks in the top 0.2%, 0.2% y'all of all podcasts. Ben has 15 years of experience in corporate finance and is a four-time Microsoft MVP for Excel. He has created one of the top online Excel courses and has over 25 million minutes of Excel training content. Despite his early career struggles, Ben has learned from failure and now inspires others through his podcast and public speaking. Welcome, Ben. Please don't tell me we're going to spend the whole hour talking about spreadsheets. We definitely <laughs> won't, but I love how much you messed up the intro, and I am happy to be here. Blooper is baked into the episode now. I like it. Blooper um, real. Blooper <laughs> real. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, no, I don't want to talk about spreadsheets. Nobody ever wants to talk about spreadsheets, but okay. actually one time I did accidentally. Um, sometimes I'll, I'll join a meeting, and I don't know if I'm the host of my own podcast. I'm guesting on someone else's. I'm just talking to somebody, so I thought we were... Just um, in a chat about some stuff, but he's a big Google Sheets guy. And we were doing, I ended up being on like a YouTube live sheet talking thing. So besides that, where we did talk about spreadsheets for an hour, <laughs> um, most people don't want to do that. So uh, yeah, I haven't talked about anything else. So but, it, it, um, is your lack ahead. of, is your lack of scheduling and, and making notes on your calendar the reason why you're the number one failure guy? No, definitely not. It's okay, just, uh, table that. Ta let's put a pin in that because I have a question I need to ask you first. Please me. tell us your story. How did you become the world's number one failure guy? Okay, so um, I'd say it took me probably five jobs of being fired before I realized I was fired from all my jobs. Because in corporate America, a lot of times you can lie to yourself. You can lie in future uh, interviews and stuff like that. So I was always telling some story about how I was pivoting in my career or whatever. I'd make up some things to explain the gaps in my, uh, you know, employment history. Uh, either I'm moving across the country or whatever the thing is. And then after five of them, I was like, oh, wait, I didn't choose any of these. They were not more than one person things. It wasn't like being laid off. It was I've been actually fired from all my jobs. So I'm like, okay, I should probably do some investigation as to what's going on there. And I was reading a lot of self-help books. And unfortunately, I wasn't seeing myself put a lot of the improvements into action. But I did read, especially in this one book called um, Mindset by Carol Dweck, where she talks about a fixed and a growth mindset. And basically how much better off people are with the growth mindset, meaning that they can do anything and achieve anything rather than, you know, um, having more self-limiting beliefs and they talked about the importance of failure and getting comfortable with failure. And so I was like, all right, I'll go get a failure license plate, which I have, it's downstairs. Um, and I'll put that on my car and then every day I'll have to see that. And it'll be a good idea. I thought for some reason, I was even surprised that it was available at the DMV which is dumb because I don't know why I was surprised. like, meaning my relationship with failure is a lot different than most people's. And so when I talk about it, I'm usually talking about it in a positive light. And I realized that a lot of people don't like that F word all that much. And so uh, a lot of times I will get people who are resistant to even calling something a failure. And then I got to do a whole dance around the subject until we can actually talk about it being a mistake, a learning experience, whatever the thing is. But I had no plan. I had no plan to do a podcast. I had no plan. I was going to maybe write a book um, called The Power of Effing Up, uh, which I would have done the swear version of, kind of like 
the subtle art of not giving a I don't know if I can swear on your podcast. So I'm just going to avoid. Yeah, it. go you ahead. Have... You can swear. <laughs> you can swear. So I was going to call it the power of fucking up or why I was happy. I was fired from every job I've ever had or something to those effects. But I was like, OK, this is just an idea for a book. But also, I only know my one brand of failure, which is getting fired. So I should interview other people about their failures. And so I decided I'd, it's not specifically successful people. You don't have to be successful to be interviewed for it, as long as you're comfortable with talking about failure. But ideally, it's people who struggled through and you know showed some resiliency and got to the other side. And so if you want to be like the world's number one accountant, there's a lot of competition on, on Google. Number one failure, pretty easy to get there. So my original goal was unofficially to have Alexa answer my name when you asked it who the world's number one failure is for the longest time. Didn't know how to answer the question at all, but if you ask the right way, it will say my name now. So that, that has happened. That doesn't do anything for me. And no one's really searching that term besides me and anyone I talk to, but it was just a funny little goal to uh, motivate me to, to keep going with it. I got to know. I have got to know. I don't have an Alexa, but I can do this, right? Hold on. I got to do it. Who is the world's number one failure? According to Wanderlust Worker, one, Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> this is the old, if you say failure guy. Dude, if you have to share the stage with somebody, I think Abraham Lincoln is a pretty cool guy to share your stage with, right? <laughs> You have to be up there with Abraham Lincoln as the world's number one failure. I, mean, I don't wonder why he's up there. I Maybe mean, he had a lot of adversity. Oh, no, he, oh him. his political career before he became president, he'd lost it. Yeah, he, he is. A, he is. He did <laughs> fail at a lot of things before he became president. But I think he, he succeeded at something that was very important and very pivotal in the history of the United States and the world. So, yeah, so yeah it's pretty cool to be up there with him. All right, did you finish your story or did I get overwhelmed by the failure thing? Um, no, I'm just saying whenever I find out the right phrasing, which usually if you put the word guy in there, you'll get it for sure. But if you don't, you're it's a crapshoot. But I also ask people all over the world, because if I'm going to do the world's number one failure, it has to be in Japan. It has to be everywhere. So I was just making sure. So yeah. Michigan would be where we're, we're checking. You got to work uh, on Michigan. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I like that uh, that having something as stupid as that as a goal yeah, is something enough to drive me. And one thing that's definitely helped and the thing that comes up um, as a result is IMDb, because you can put your podcast on IMDb, like oh, I yeah. mentioned. This is how we since, this is how we met each other. Yeah. And since yeah. Amazon owns IMDb now and they own Alexa, I think especially them two are talking with each other and giving the right answer. Because yeah. unofficially I wanted the robot to to say my name. I love it. I <laughs> love it. <laughs> so let's talk about IMDb. Why do podcasts need to be on IMDb? And that that is a total non sequitur there. No one is going to, from, from your intro and from the very beginning of this conversation, no one knew we were going to go there. <laughs> yeah. So what you can do is if you have a podcast, you don't need to pay an account on IMDb, but you can put your podcast on IMDb. If you want a free resource, it's audio linked, L-I-N-K-E-D, kind of like LinkedIn, audio linked.com. It's just my website where I put a how-to guide. There's no ads or anything. It'll just tell you how to do it. Um, and so the benefits are if you want to rank for something like who's the world's number one failure or any of your things, um, the the website IMDb, which is the Internet Movie Database, uh, it's typically used for like movies, TV shows and things like that. But they recently opened it up for uh, music videos, podcasts, commercials and other things that are not your typical long form uh, movie or TV show. And so uh, the great thing about it is you can give uh, not only your guests credit for being on the episode, like you can make them a person on IMDb if they don't exist yet. Uh, you can offer it to your guests as you bring them on. You can say, by the way, this will give you an IMDb credit. But you can also, if you have editors, sound editors, or any other people in your production staff, you can credit them. So I'm the director, executive producer. I'm an actor as failure guy. I'm not myself. because I don't want to be a failure <laughs> forever. <laughs> so you can do all sorts of different things, including they have a really high page authority. I think it's like 95 page authority. And so you can link to your own sites. You can link to your guest sites. You can have taglines and things like that. And it, so it's all, it all helps with your SEO and it's free. And it's a good way to give credit to people. And also like if, so I had Carol Baskin on the podcast and 
William Hung. And so if you go to any of their IMDb pages and look under self, you'll see my podcast there. So it's a nice thing to have if you get anybody who's uh, notable or at all already on there. Um, it'll just bump up the popularity of your of your thing. Cool. I, I have um, interviewed quite a few people that have IMDb profiles, none of them at that level. Um, but it's it is kind of cool to then click it. You know, you add them to as a guest on your show and then you click it, click their name and you can see everything else they've done. So yeah. it's it's an it's nice the way that database is linked. And you know, it's a database, so you know something a little bit about databases. That's true. Yep. And the <laughs> only thing I've had rejected so far is I try to give Arnold Schwarzenegger a special thanks because we did terrible impersonations of him in one of one episode and that got rejected. But because other than he that, wasn't which cheap. it should have been rejected, it should not have gone there. Uh, but other than that, I've not really had much that didn't get past the uh, the folks. So now my stuff gets uh, accepted much more easily. It's kind of like Wikipedia. I think once they see that you contribute enough, they're they're less stringent on some of the stuff. But it's fabulous. And if anybody, the more episodes you have, the harder it is because you got to put them. You don't have to yeah. put them all on there. So I'd say if you have a ton of episodes, just put your favorite ones or the ones with the most memorable people. But the earlier you start, the better. The only thing is that it has to be released already in order for you to put it on there. If it's well, and, and the, released, the hot then... tip is make it a habit because Candace didn't make it a habit. So <laughs> now, now it's a little behind. <laughs> so mine even automatically does it now. When how? I publish it, I don't know. I don't know how. Maybe because it goes to Audible and, and Amazon owns Audible. But now it's frustrating because if I change the name of the title of the episode, like before it hits Apple... And maybe it published just to my thing, it'll show up wrong in IMDb. And I'm like, so I'll have to go correct things. It's like not how it usually works. But I think it's because either they're sick of me sending it in every time or they just started automating more of it. I'm not sure. But see if it shows up automatically for you because I wasn't sure why my, no. it was showing up instantaneously before it even hit Apple, Apple's wow. directory. It so that's why I knew it was probably through Audible because they most things refer to Apple as like the source. Yeah, maybe you have a better you've um maybe you link to your Audible link. I don't think so. I don't know. But I didn't you do anything what? different. At now least. And I'm then it very curious. Up. I'm very curious because um I show up on Audible. I do, so I'm very curious. <laughs> yeah. I'm annoyed though, because it shows up and then I gotta change it. It's a little bit different than my usual thing. So I'm not annoyed. I'm just confused. confused. I want to figure out confused. how it gets there. So it must be automated because it happens like immediately. So I was talking to somebody recently about SpaceX. Oh, <laughs> speaking of famous people, I was actually speaking to the director of the Vatican Observatory recently about <laughs> the SpaceX rocket that just uh, launched. And uh, yeah, I'm going to name drop. <laughs> you did. So <laughs> I get to too. <laughs> yeah. So uh, we were talking about how the SpaceX uh, flight recently exploded in midair mm -hmm. and that everybody was talking about how it was a big failure and SpaceX was all excited about the explosion. And I think you have the same mindset as SpaceX, which is an engineering mindset, which is a science mindset, which is failure is good. Because if you don't have failure, that means you're not experimenting hard enough that your theories aren't out there. Yes, exactly. Yeah. You're not expanding your comfort zone. Uh, you're not doing things outside of the the box. So um, two things I will rename drop real quick. <laughs> so, uh, and by that, I mean, another name I was recently, I do a lot of AI artwork. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but recently Grimes, uh, Elon's ex wife um, and baby mama, uh, who is a EDM artist. She was holding, holding this prompt jam on discord. And so thousands of people were generating AI art for her and the founder of Mid Journey, which is the name of the AI art platform. But they were liking what I was doing. So they brought me up on stage. I got to talk to her, so Elon's ex wife and the founder of the AI art platform about some of the stuff I was making, which was pretty cool. Um, that is pretty cool. Not at all relevant besides the fact that it's Elon's ex wife. But uh, I was we just excited. There. I was just excited to talk to her. And so I agree with the failure thing in terms of um, so I just started doing stand up comedy. I've done eight now open mics and uh i'd say two of them were probably bombs as in not didn't go as planned or i didn't get any as many laughs i wanted which is pretty decent out of the, the amount of them there are but since there's so much failure baked into stand-up comedy and you have to bomb like no matter what comedian 
you talk to, they'll say that they've had nights where they didn't get laughs. So like doing things like that, even the ones where I mess up and I bomb, I'm excited because I get to know what I did wrong or figure out some, because when everything goes right, you don't learn as much as you do from when things go wrong. Like earlier, I mentioned, I had an episode that I released that was only 20 minutes long, even though it was an hour long conversation. I've always since then looked for that recording in the top left hand corner of zoom and made sure that's on if I'm in the middle of a meeting. Cause that's what the mistake was there that I made is that I didn't double check that we were recording again. So um, I made sure when we rejoined here that yours is recording. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, but I learned so much more from messing up and I learned way more even than like Thanks, I say, dude, my- <laughs> the audience never would have known that we had that blip if you hadn't just called it out. <laughs> you can edit it out. I mean, I'll, I'll just make it difficult for you. <laughs> um, but uh, like even from editing, so like all the mistakes I've made in terms of interrupting people or doing all sorts of weird things that I end up disliking, like I seem to only be able to learn from my own mistakes, even interviewing other people, which is what I'm doing for the podcast. I don't learn as much as I do from actually messing up myself. I feel like sometimes it's the only way I can learn is by doing it the wrong way or just trying. But when things go all smoothly, you don't really learn yeah. what about it went, went well. Yeah. It's really hard as a parent to let your kids make mistakes. Yeah. And I think that maybe a whole generation, my generation of parents really screwed that up because we didn't want our kids to make mistakes Mm -hmm. and look what's happened. (laughs) Yeah. You can kind of go the other way. Like um, wanting to make things as least painful as possible for, uh, for your kids. And I think, I think it was the founder of Spanx has some speech that she gives where she talks about her parents and how at the dinner table, her dad would ask her what she failed at that day. Oh, wow. And like encouraged them to have something to say that they tried and didn't succeed at. But I love that question. Yeah. You can probably watch her thing and get a more accurate thing retelling oh. of it because I might not be right. But whatever her name is from Spanx. <laughs> I'll find it. I'll, I will find it and it will be in the show notes, y'all. And I'm going to watch it because that sounds like something I need to see. Um, I am a fan of failure. I learned so much. You know, I've, I've been in business with my husband for 25 years and on my own for five years. I mean, my husband mm-hmm. and I are business partners, but I have my my thing yeah. that I do and he has the his thing that he do, does now. But, you know, 25 years of owning your own business, you make a lot of mistakes. You know, and you learn from those mistakes. And we used to call it throwing darts at the wall. Mm -hmm. Now, you can have a strategy. And if your strategy is throwing darts at the wall, great. But but even if you have a strategy, you aren't on your aim. Yeah, you aren't always (laughs) going to get it right. Right. You aren't always going to get it right. And there's so many variables. I like to talk about marketing and archery being very similar Um, or not having an I have an archery analogy for marketing. So when you are pulling the string back or the pulling back the, the string and holding, holding the bow, pulling back the string, mm-hmm. you pull it back as far as you can and you aim and then you release and it hits the target or not. And then you have to keep adjusting until you get it right. That's the very synopsized version of that story. Um, but it's also all about form and wind and how you're feeling that day and how strong your shoulder is, which, mm-hmm. you know, is the content, your shoulder, you could say is the content and the arrow you could say is, are you shooting at the right people? Is the target, the right client? You know, there's, there's the, the yeah. whole archery analogy. I should write. Are you it. creating enough tension? Yeah. Are you creating enough tension? Right. Are you, are, is a lot of people are tempted to aim down here or to aim up here? No, you got to aim right here. You know, there's a whole, it's place, everything, everything, All of that goes into whether or not the arrow hits the target and whether or not it hits the bullseye, Mm -hmm. you know? So do you do much archery in real life? Not anymore. I, I, I was a certified archery instructor. Could you tell by, by by the way, I could tell by the fact that you got really deep into it. I got got really (laughs) deep into it, Uh, but I don't shoot anymore, but I grew from the age of four. I was shooting a bow. My, Mm -hmm. I, you know, some kids have, swings in their backyard some kids have sandboxes in their backyard my entire childhood we had an archery range in our backyard that's awesome i know (laughs) um if you remind me i have a gift for you at the end of this 
Oh, ooh, I like gifts. Gratitude, right? Yeah. Gifts. Yeah. I love it. I don't have to go grab it at the end. I love um, it. So uh, what were we talking about? Anything specific? Oh, archery, messing we're up business messing mistakes. Messing up business, business mistakes. All right. Let's let's strategize for the, or, or not strategize, but let's give the, the audience some tips for taking failure and turning it into lessons. What, what, yes. what, how can we do that? Well, first of all, do more things that are outside of your comfort zone. So if you um, are going to, so let's say you're thinking about doing something and you get that tinge of fear that the, that you might be approaching failure. You might be doing something that is a little bit outside of your comfort zone, outside of the box, might not work. If you're feeling that fear, I'd say to try as much as possible to use that fear as fuel to push you in the direction of the thing that you're trying to do. Because as long as you're not hurting anybody or doing anything self-destructive, um, that fear usually is because you're stepping outside of your comfort zone and doing something that you're not, um, that you haven't yet done. And then I'd say if you're in the middle of experiencing failure or if you're um, not succeeding at the moment, uh, it's perfectly fine to grieve and like, you know, and experience that failure. But one of the most important things is to make sure that you don't kind of, you know, men in black yourself about it and forget what happened. You want to make sure that you extract because you've already paid the price of the cost of the failure. You want to make sure that you can extract all the lessons that you can from that. So kind of having like a postmortem almost on your failure uh, once you've given it time to not sting so much because you don't want to immediately you know, go past the feelings of actually experiencing it. But also uh, at some point you need to go, okay, well, what happened there? What went wrong? How can I learn from it? And then I'd say like the, one of the better things is in the future, let's say you have a successful podcast that you recorded a full episode and the last one you didn't. Uh, when you have the good one, pat yourself on the back and say, I wouldn't have maybe done this properly if I didn't have that prior mistake. And so try to recognize when you're having a success, what other mistakes you'd built on to kind of get to that point. How many episodes have you, rec have you recorded for your, for your podcast? Recorded uh, probably 130 ish. And how least. many, how many have you released? 87. Uh, okay. And how many of them did you have to ditch? Like throw away? Uh, I've have some that I haven't yet ditched. I'm just hoarding them still, but like one, the guy changed the name of his app. So I'm definitely not releasing it, uh, yeah. but it's my own fault. Some are a year old or more. I just haven't officially ditched them. So I don't feel bad, uh, but they're, but let's say probably 10 out of the 40 plus will probably have to go because they're either irrelevant or uh, the quality or something about it is just uh, is I'm um, we'll have to either redo it, like rebook it with that person or just get rid of it and scrap it totally. You're, this is probably episode 180. I don't know the numbers because I'm not, I've, one of the things that I'm letting go of is the perfectionism of having to release my episodes in the same order I recorded them. Oh, so now is I, that now, something you did? That's something I did. So now I'm releasing them in the order that I think they need to go in. Gotcha. And so I'm not numbering them anymore. So I, I don't know where we are, but I think you're about 180 mm -hmm. and I screwed up your intro in three different places. <laughs> All right. So <laughs> repetition is great and you just have to let it go. If you screw up, you screw up, you know, failure yeah. is part of the process, you know, and I'm sure that you have the same issue. Yeah. Um, one that I like to mention is Scott Gazzoli. I call him Scott Fazzoli, which is like a, a bad fast food Italian place, um, depending on where you're living in the United States. Um, but I leave that in and I leave it in. I've, I messed up so many names that I know, and I know the name too, because I know them pretty well. But a lot of times I won't even try to look up the right pronunciation. Like Stephen Levine, I said Levine, or it doesn't matter. I have the way to check these things out. A lot of times I will avoid doing research in in some way. Like in my brain, I'm uh, trying to keep it less biased, but really I just am lazy. And so mm -hmm. if I don't go hear all the things that they like to talk about, I won't necessarily be drawn towards talking about those things, but also I just don't like. Uh, I, as you know, I have a lot of my own episodes I haven't released. Yeah, I don't have time to listen to a lot of podcasts. Of yeah, 50 that like you that. Haven't 40. I haven't at one point it was 37, but I just keep recording more. So, 
I, I, I've had, I was, I don't guest on shows very often, but in the last couple of weeks, a couple of guest episodes where I, well, I was the guest have been released and I haven't had a chance to listen to them. So I can say thank you to the, to the host yet. Well, and I feel one thing guilty. that I, I did recently and um, I got the idea from, uh, I'm not going to try to say his name. I'll, I'll forget it, but um, make a, so Spotify playlist of all your guest appearances, and then you can share that. Yeah. Which I hadn't done yet. So I, I recently went through all my guest appearances and added them to, if they were in Spotify, I added them to a playlist that I could then share. Cause I was like, I don't have this uh, documented really anywhere. And You're the like a- second person who suggested to do that. And I, I don't use Spotify to listen to podcasts. I use good pods because I love that. I platform. love good pods too. I was using good pods earlier to listen, but I'll just add it to. Can you make I, a playlist on good pods? Oh, I don't know. So what I mean is like, I will make a short link to my Apple link and my Spotify link. Cause those are the two major ones yeah. that people listen to. And then I will personally listen to usually on good pods, but I do have Spotify premium. So I figured I'd make a playlist of my guest appearances. Cause I don't know how you can do that on good pods, but you probably can create a collection or something. It might be called something else. Good Pods is such a fun platform. If y'all in the audience, if you aren't listening to podcasts via Good Pods, you should because it's a great way for you to talk to the host of the show. Like chances yes. are, if you leave a comment on one of my episodes, I'm going to comment back, right? If you follow yeah. me, I'm going to follow you. So because it's it's like it's like Facebook for podcasting, only better. Yeah, you know? I'm at a uh, at Podfest. JJ, who started it, was there. She's awesome. I got to meet her. And uh, I've always liked good pods. It's nice. It's got a nice little commenting and functionality. And uh, I just, that's the one I go to usually for a while. I was using Stitcher, but um, only because I was paying for the premium. So I didn't have ads on one of my favorite podcasts. I was using Stitcher forever. And then they have my feed messed up and they have the art wrong artwork on my feed. And they won't (laughs) let me, they won't let me log in to change it, even though I had an account you know, a creator account. And so now I'm mad at Stitcher. So I don't want to listen to the pod podcast on Stitcher anymore. Isn't that petty That's of me? <laughs> no, I have those beef, those kind of beefs as well, where I just am like, I mean, seriously, right, well, it's the wrong graphic. It Why hurts do you me not more than it hurts. Right? Yeah. <laughs> it hurts me the, more the than the it hurts them. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. But, but, but good yeah, pods it, is fun. Yeah, it's a I great way to find new episodes. Okay, go ahead. No, you're good. I'm saying, uh, I'm just saying, I agree. I was listening to Akimbo. One of the, one of the few podcasts I listened to is Seth Godin's Akimbo. And I was listening to that on Good Pods earlier. Oh, I didn't know he had a podcast. I used to yeah. absorb everything that he put. And if he, if he so, put something out, I would absorb it. But it's been a you while. You have got to check out Akimbo. I have to catch up. A-K-I-M-B-O. Yeah. All right. Uh, it's it's one on day, he, he does not script a word of it um per me asking him he said he didn't and uh basically it's always gold so i'd say i that's one of the ones i never miss i'll catch up at some point i mean i'll miss it for a yeah. couple weeks but i'll eventually catch up uh but it's only like uh 30 minutes or less and it's all him by himself and then answering questions from uh listeners and i've had a two one or two questions answered on the podcast have you so you how do you submit the question uh, I think it's a Kimbo.link is where you go. And but then I you mentioned just... my failure guy podcast. I was like, I'm starting a podcast called the failure guy podcast, blah, blah, blah. And then I got a guest through that too. Who reached out to me. Uh, Cause I mentioned the name of it, but wow. he had a really cool. good uh, analogy on, on failure and what to do. I love that. It. I think yeah. that's it. He, I mean, he's like mega famous, but he's also mega approachable. Yeah, I've done three of his workshops. Um, it's a Kimbo workshops, which uh, does like one on podcasting, one on uh, creative, being a creative, and then one on marketing. But I think they're all done now. I don't think they're doing those anymore. They just have the Alt MBA or something like that. But he, it's cool because you get to go on Zoom calls with him and stuff like that, or at oh. least group ones. But there's a lot of um, cool ways of of people holding each other accountable and trying to get progress done on certain things i just like the way he thinks as a as a someone who has to sell something at some point uh i like the way that he thinks about the relationship between marketing and and people yeah yeah 
And he always comes up with great analogies. Yeah, exactly. Pretty good. Okay. I want to talk about Excel for just a minute. Perfect. So is there anything about Excel that, what is something that you wish everybody knew about Excel that they don't know? Well, I feel like um, a lot of people think it either is everything. It can do anything you want. Absolutely. All the things. So they're like, so confused. They don't know where to start with it or they think they can do nothing. Cause when you open it up, it's just a blank little thing and it looks really boring and, and ridiculous. So I'd say for the people who, who don't realize what it can do, um, if you do anything in, in finance or with numbers or anything at all uh, with math, there's most likely a good way you can use Excel to make your life easier. Um, but also for people who think you can do everything, there's probably a lot of times when that's not the solution to go to and there's other things that will do it easier. Um, but I think the main thing would be don't be scared of it because it's not it's actually making math easier for you. It usually makes your life easier. You'll save more time and things like that. But a lot of people just get scared or they fall asleep halfway through the word Excel. So, you know, <laughs> I try to figure out how to make it more enjoyable. I'm making a course right now for O'Reilly uh, textbooks and I'm trying to figure out how to make um, financial modeling more fun than just income statement, balance sheet, cash flow stuff, which is all very very boring and also it has to be specifically right. So I'm trying to figure out how to make it better. Even if it's just putting Jim and Pam from the office as characters or whatever the thing is, you know, like making any of it uh, more enjoyable, some artwork, things like that. Um, yeah. I'm trying to be less in Excel when I'm showing things more conceptually because uh, I'm, I say doing the impossible, making Excel fun and it might be impossible, but I'm going to keep trying to do it in different ways. And I'm also doing, making an, an escape room in Excel so that you can basically using AI artwork, um, telling a story and you're solving a puzzle and escaping various kind of like a choose your own adventure thing with Excel. I'm in shock. That's yeah. brilliant genius. Holy it, moly. It's on holdish, or at least I have a, a class in Canada that's working on it right now, um, helping me out with it. But yeah, that's an idea because I can make all sorts of crazy things in AI art. You come up with a story, you could you come come with math problems that are more riddleish, and it's more like a game than than your XYZ company selling a widget or yeah, you know. But if you solve the problem in the spreadsheet, you get to the next level. That's really yeah. cool. And I was I got approved to teach um, on out school, which is ages three to eighteen. So. I had to do like all this child online privacy protection stuff, COPPA or whatever. So meaning I'm not sure what age specifically it would be good for, but anyone in the younger demographic too would probably enjoy that a lot more. And you know, as I, of, I can totally see you teaching kids. Yeah. So as of April 27th, I incorporated a 501 C3 nonprofit in Kansas city called pure creative art where we talk about art and technology and whatnot. So I have a nonprofit that I'm the president, founder, treasurer, vice president, all the <laughs> spots <laughs> um, that I'm going to be hopefully uh, teaching some folks. I'd say probably the lower income demographic. I'm not sure if it'll be ch children or adults, but about art and technology and things like that, because there's a lot of cool things going on. And a lot of times um, people don't have access to it or access to the info about it yeah but also i've i joke that i've I'm, i've already had an llc that's a nonprofit for so many years that i <laughs> i still have a regular one but uh, i just have wanted to do more things uh on that path and i was like you know what i'll just fail it till i nail it and i'll start in a 501c3 so fail i'll it. figure out what's going on there but <laughs> fail it Till you nail it. Yes. I don't like fake it till you make it. I don't like fake it till you make it because it's all about faking it and imposter yeah. syndrome. But fail it till you nail it is going to be the, likely the name of the book that I will be writing. I, I have a confession. And listener, I apologize because <laughs> this confession might might in, in include you. Um, I have all been all about personal branding, personal branding, personal branding because I thought it was really important to differentiate yourself with your personal brand. And then I saw an episode of um, South Park where they were making fun of personal brands. 
And I realized just how ridiculous that is. <laughs> that whole fake it till you make a thing. Mm-hmm. And so I like the fail it till you till you nail it. A yeah, because you that's what you do is you just mess it up until you figure out how to how to do it right. Yeah. Yeah. But a lot it's funny because in the my first public speech, and I'm doing more public speaking now. Um, but I, I said it just put up on the slide. I said, fake it till you make it. And like one person started clapping because they liked that. And then I'm like, I hate this saying. And I felt bad for the person who, this is one person who like was jazzed about it. And then I was like, oh, I'm sorry. Well, it's not really my thing. That's the, uh, the, the problem that a lot of people have with affirmations, I am statements, because they feel like they're lying to themselves. So mm-hmm. I figured out a way to turn those lies into truths just by the way that you phrase it. I did a lot of, I, I, I combined a whole bunch of different, my keynote that I give most often is, a, is this topic, but I combine a lot of different theories and ideas and sits, you know, and turn it into one thing that really works. And it it's the, because I am statements are like, they, they are lies. I am not a mega millionaire. You know, I'm not wearing a size 10 and I, I look fantastic in a bikini. Who, why mm-hmm. am I lying to myself? And that's the fake it till you make it thing, but fail it, fail it till you nail it. Why am I so thin? You know, I'm mm-hmm. failing it until I figure out how to do it. Right. I've been yeah. failing at being thin and now I'm getting it right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, yeah. I don't know why I always come back to weight, weight loss examples when I talk about affirmations. <laughs> Is that subliminal? <laughs> well, you're looking in the mirror probably too, is part of it. Right. We're always looking. No, at... I never look in the mirror when I say my affirmations. Cause I, you, I'm looking in, you the in front of the mirror. I'm in, lo- I'm looking at the future. Don't they say to do it in front of a mirror? Oh, yeah, I think that's bullshit. I picture people doing it in front of a mirror. That's bullshit. That's that's um, that's that guy who was a senator. He he became a senator from Minnesota, and he he was on Saturday Night Live. Um, Curly hair. He, oh, man, what is his name? Al Franken? Al Franken. That's that's an Al Franken bit. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I forgot what we were even saying. What did I say? What was an Al Franken bit? The I am statements. Gosh oh, darn it, yeah. I like yeah. myself. <laughs> he, uh, what is it? I'm smart, um, funny, and gosh darn it, people like people me. People like me, that's it. Yeah. Like that? That's it. <laughs> uh, Stuart Smalley, I think, is it, or something like that. No, I don't, oh, I don't remember. Uh, I'm going to, yeah. You, okay, Everyone's you like know, yelling at their thing. Like, the Al okay. Franken I am statement meme will be in the show notes, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> um. But I, I think the same thing you're saying, or instead of I am, you could say I will be mm. a millionaire or whatever. Mm. You know? I, I have a better way. I have a better way. It's you, Why am I you, such a millionaire? You, you phrase it as a question. <laughs> this and I, a I learned this from a, from a guy came, named Noah St. John. So mm-hmm. you phrase it as a question. Instead of saying affirmations, you ask yourself affirmations and an affirmation forms the idea in your mind so when you say why am i a millionaire your brain goes to work and starts to answer so the question why am i not a millionaire no why am i a millionaire that's and then, even more confusing to me be, no because then your your brain is like okay the reason why you are wealthy is because you purchased a house and you didn't you know over you didn't over mortgage you and that created generational wealth through the mortgage you invested your money you started a business you you know you did you know you you come up with all these ways in your ha- mm-hmm. head to make money by answering the question why am i a millionaire and then eventually when you start taking inspired action on those answers that your brain produces that's when mm-hmm. the money starts to come in so it's the inspired action that leads to the affirmation. Gotcha. So it's a, it's a process. Just staring so, at yourself in the mirror and saying, "I'm a millionaire. I'm a millionaire." You're never going to become a millionaire. You don't you don't do anything until you take action. You have to fail, right? You have to fail over and over again before you win. Mhm. Absolutely. It's what you I I wonder if you have thoughts on this on this. I was thinking about this the other day. People who get their Oscars on their first or second film, how many of them do you ever see in a movie again? Adrian Brody. Brody. Um, right? He, uh, what, the pianist? Is that what it was that he wanted? Something like that, yeah. Yeah, I think um, it's the pianist. I don't know. Uh, so your basic question is like, if you knock it out of the park immediately, do you rest on your laurels kind of thing, or do you 
uh, come out with the same tenacity in the future. Well, I, I, I want to like, hear. I want to hear your thoughts on that. What uh, do you think? I mean, it would depend. Um, I think. Well, we know Leonardo DiCaprio didn't win one for the longest time. He's done a lot of great stuff. I don't know if we'd have to do like a. We'd have to get Excel about it. We'd have to like look up people and see how they did it because I have no idea. I just know anecdotally what I would the, think. The database dude wants the data before he comes up with an answer. Yeah, okay, well, that makes sense. I don't know if they if they are statistically more or less likely to win. It's probably um, you'll have like the one hit wonders, you know, just like a music that will do a good thing. But like, like then a guy who's played Napoleon Dynamite, you don't hear about him that much, John Heder or whatever. Um, he did some other things, but like he was really good for that role. Maybe sometimes they just like are good for this one thing, yeah. And they're not a great broad range actor, or people don't want them as that, or something like that. But I think, I think, um, I wouldn't say getting denied an award is a good thing necessarily, but but it doesn't hurt to keep you resilient and striving towards it. Um, so I don't know. I mean, I wouldn't wish to not win the first time, you know? So this is nothing like the Oscars, but my daughter's 24. So this was years ago. This is 10 years ago, probably. No, eight years ago. Hold 24. I don't know. I can't do 16. math in my head. She was six. Yeah. She was about 16 when, when she stopped going, being in Girl Scouts. So, mm-hmm. so from Age seven to age 16, she was in Girl Scouts, with which meant mommy was in Girl Scouts, right? And I did a lot of really amazing things for the Girl Scouts because I'm a natural born leader. I mean, I'm not bragging. It's just true. I'm a natural born leader. And when things needed to get done, I got stuff done because I get stuff mm-hmm. done. And, um, and cookies, too. <laughs> a lot of cookies. <laughs> but, but I fully expected to get the award for leader of the year, Girl Scout leader of the year. And I never did not once, not once did I ever get leader of the year. And then my daughter wasn't in Girl Scouts anymore. So there's never, ever going to be an opportunity for me to get leader of the year, even though I probably deserved it more than any other leader. (laughs) I'm not, I'm saying I'm in my book, you are the leader of the year for the Girl Scouts, whoever won. But you know what? The lesson there is to do the work anyway, Mm because I got the, uh, if the award didn't exist, I would have been doing the work anyway. Yeah. You know, so do the work anyway. If it makes you happy, do it anyway. The award is just like ice cream or ice cream with your cake or, you know, it's an apple pie with the ice cream, whatever, you know. But you want an apple pie with your ice cream or you want ice cream with your whatever. Yeah, you do want. If you do ice want cream, the award. If the ice cream is available, <laughs> hell yeah, yeah, I want the ice cream absolutely. on my pie. But if it's not, I'm going to enjoy the pie anyway. Yeah. With right? the Oscars and myself, I'd say if you're in the top six, you already won. Yeah. Mm-hmm. To be nominated, yeah. to be nominated. Yeah. That's, that's pretty re- remarkable. There's a lot of people who didn't get nominated. Yeah. Yeah. And I wonder how much of that is writing. Cause you were talking about how the, it was that role. Oh yeah, know, exactly. You know? Like it, 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 cause the actor is just a vessel for the script. For the script. Yeah. 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 I mean, that was a well-written role. So of course she won the Oscar. Right. I think it's a combination course, of, of, course. of some and of those things. Sometimes just the universe comes together for with things, you know, it, it's the right time, the timing yeah. is right or whatever. But I don't know. I, I, I think we give away too many awards. Well, what would you so I, I give every guest a get out of fail free card? <laughs> what would you do with it if you could do it? So like I used to say stand up comedy, but now I'm doing it. Um, but there's a lot of failure involved. So is there something that you would do, a hobby or passion a career oh, we're something. on the topic i was really into theater in high school and when you know when i was in college i helped out with a children's theater i was a stage manager for a children's theater and then i just sort of let it go and i was pretty good and i wonder if i'm i could still do it so yeah give me a role in a movie what would you be uh, Mar- marvel villain a Marvel villain? Oh, thanks. A 53 year old. Yeah, why not? Why not? No, I'd want to be in something more sci fi. I mean, Marvel is fantasy. I want to be. I don't more, like Marvel movies. That's just what I yeah, usually say. I'd want to be something more, more sci fi, right? Uh, yeah, you some, could be a um, space thing. You could be a time traveler. A time traveler would be cool too. 
but so, but something I want to be in a spaceship. Yeah, I want to be something on a spaceship. Hell yeah! And it can be an alien. I wouldn't mind being an alien on a spaceship. Oh, yeah. okay, yeah, that'd yeah. be fun. Uh, I think it'd be awesome. I I feel like I wouldn't be able to learn my lines. Yeah. Yeah, I can't I, even well, remember my jokes when I get up on stage for stand up. So I'm like, I don't know how good I'll be at but here's, memorizing exactly what to say. The reason why I have a podcast is because when I was a kid, I wanted to be an actor. And then I thought, oh, it might be fun to be a radio DJ. Mm-hmm. And then I started a podcast because I wasn't a radio DJ and podcasting. This was 10 years ago. Ben, I've had a podcast for 10 years. So That's I started crazy. my podcast 10 years ago after my, I had a YouTube talk show for two years before the podcast. I mm-hmm. did all that because you can, and it's something I always wanted to do. Right. Yeah. So totally failure. Right. <laughs> yeah. Did I and, uh, so we, that, did you do college radio? No, I actually had. So in college, I had two friends that worked at the radio station and I don't know what prevented me from saying, Hey, get me a job. It was a small town. So it was a local radio station. Yeah. Right. And I could have I, easily gotten a job there. I did college radio. Did you? I did a college radio show. Yeah. This wasn't but a then, college. This was the local radio station, but it was a very small town. Well, it was a very small school. I mean, like you had to be in the vicinity of school to like hear, but the cafeteria was always listening and whatever. But um, yeah, that was uh, that was fun. And my first real shot at doing anything like that. But it was oh, just cool. uh, me and my roommate, the Ben and Mark show. I love that. I love that. When I was in high school, I, I grew up in the Monterey Bay of California, and Robert Louis Stevenson is a very hoity-toity private school in um, uh, in the south part of the Bay. And they had a radio station. The high school had a radio station, and they always had the best music. So mm-hmm. that's the station I would listen to. I wouldn't listen to the other the local station where my friends worked. <laughs> <laughs> I listened to the high school radio station because I liked British. I liked new wave and there they played pop and R and B. That's awesome. Yeah. I, I, I loved it. It's really cool to see behind the scenes. We even had like some guy come in and play on the acoustic and stuff. I mean, it was a fun time and I think I'd want to try. Uh, I was just in LA um, and I was just, I did stand up in Hollywood actually oh, how um, fun. on Friday. So like a week, a little less than a week ago. Um, but I was thinking I would want to try at some point acting and see how it would be. But the memorizing the lines would be the tough part for me, for sure. Yesterday. Not, and not just the acting, obviously. I don't know what the hell I would do. I, I don't have any background in it. So you have theater background, you'd know. Maybe. But it was so long ago, dude. I don't remember any of it. <laughs> I mean, and... I, the two years I did it where it was, you know, it was semi-professional theater. I was a stage manager for a children's theater. What was kind of yeah. cool, though, was some of those kids were on the local PBS station. Um, and a, there was a children's television show. And some of them were on that show. They, those kids loved me because I was this <laughs> 20, 20, 21-year-old, you know, with a convertible. And their parents all trusted me. And so they would like, Candace, can you take us to the zoo? Sure, I'll take you to the zoo. So I had to be hanging out with all these 12 year olds, (laughs) (laughs) which was fun. Do you think you can handle acting on a green screen? Because if you're in space and a spaceship, you're going to need to be. Oh, yeah. Why not? Dealing with fictional aliens. How is that any (laughs) different than having a green screen for my podcast? Right. It's not. Do you you have one? No, Um. I don't. I don't because I like my artwork on the back of my wall. I know that most. So it's different tell, in the fact that you don't do it. Yeah, but but most you know most people say don't put artwork on your back. You have have, have a nice clean wall, non distracting. I'm like screw that. I want it's people. To see, I want people to see what I am. Yeah. I didn't yeah. do this on purpose though. I just haven't. I moved here in, in January and I haven't put anything up on the walls yet. But I usually would have. Actually, I've got an alternate setup downstairs that I'm using for the uh, for the Excel training right now. So like my failure license plate, all my other background stuff. I have down in the basement. Um, oh, fun. But yeah, and I just got off a cruise. Um, the last thing I'll say is I just got off a cruise of dentists. Smiles at sea is what it was called. A uh, cruise. For, I'm not a dentist. I'm not even, I don't even like going to the dentist, but I'm doing a lot of stuff. Um, and I'm going to be doing a, uh, a public speaking competition for the dentistry industry in August called Dentistry's Got Talent. And I'm going to be competing against William Hung and some other people. Is it like a TED talk off basically? 
how, how did you get hooked up with the dental industry? Uh, so in, at PodFest, I met um, DJ Smiles, who <laughs> is also, he used to be in dentistry, but he does this thing called Smiles at Sea, which we just had last week. Um, and it's a dentistry industry event. And so they're all getting continuing education credits for it. But I don't do anything in dentistry. So I was just uh, hanging out during the day and just doing a lot of networking, but um, I'm going to be uh, competing in New Orleans in August. And so basically it's, everyone does a 10 minute Ted talk kind of thing. And it's for a larger audience of dentists and judges. And then if you beat your little cohort, which would be like uh, a group of like five people. So it's 30 total. If you get to the next round, it's just um, judges and they're all speaking scouts and uh, you have to do a five minute one there. And I was talking to the person who won in 2019. They used to be a dentist. Now they're a full time international speaker and they're going to coach me for free. Lauren King is her name. L-O-R-E-N King. And so I've been doing all sorts of weird networking and stuff. And uh, and then I missed two flights this past weekend. So a lot of failure around my travel travel plans, including falling asleep at the gate and then waking up. It was a different city than Kansas City. I was like, no, I already oh my missed a gosh. different flight yesterday. <laughs> oh, no. Wow. So wow. I learned a bit. And I, I promised I would tell everyone never to fly spirit. So if anyone's up there. I did not have a great time on spirit. So take that. I wish you'd ask salt. me first. I would have told you that. <laughs> They're not a sponsor, right? I'm yeah, not no, no, <laughs> no. Um, yeah. I know spend, everyone told me that. Spend already. the extra hundred dollars people. Yeah. You know, you will you, anyways on the bags. And you yeah. Don't realize it. Just spend the to. extra hundred dollars. Don't even, they so don't, I, des- they don't deserve you as a client. I made it back on a United flight. I still had a, another spirit one leaving later. That I could have taken, but I wasn't going to make it back to my concert in time. And I had a meet and greet ticket to a concert. So it was just such a, and I did all this work and then I fell asleep in front of the gate and then I had to get another one. I was like, oh, my. but I made it with five minutes to spare for the meet and greet. So, wow, that's impressive. literally five minutes. So. Yeah. You know what? In the long run, you'll probably figure out that there is a reason why. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So what I've learned from you today is just say yes. Say yes to opportunities. To more things for sure. Yeah. yeah. If uh, And expand your comfort zone. Do one thing every day that like, you know, is a little bit outside of your comfort zone. Talk to a stranger, whatever the thing is. Uh, maybe that's not a great one if you're a kid and don't talk to strangers or whatever. But, you know, do it safely. You know, where like live life. Put the put the bowling alley bumpers down for like, you know, one frame or something like that and see what happens. Yeah. Vinny Podestivo invited me to a networking event and you were there and that's how I met you. Yes. So I said, of course, if Vinny invites you to something, you say yes, right? Yeah. If Vinny does anything, <laughs> I'll say yes. I'll be like, I don't care what it is. Sure. I'm down for it. <laughs> so, so that's how I met you. So I said yes to an opportunity and you were there. So um, if you could pick one marketing tool tip or technique, what would it be? Um, is to look at sales instead of um like any kind of financial transaction or anything related to making money or um or anything like that i'd say is to look at sales as earning the right to make a recommendation so finding out enough about somebody so that you can recommend something that they can use whether it's your service or someone else's but like until you find a need that you can fit or like that you can help um fulfill you shouldn't be trying to sell somebody something until you know that they need whatever it is you have. So the objective of sales would be to get to the point where you understand enough to then make that recommendation. If that's what you're trying to do. And that's been the best way for me to try to figure out how to reframe. Cause I don't feel like, I don't like feeling like a car salesman or like I'm doing anything cause of money. So it's more like, uh, well, I know the thing I'm going to provide is more worth more than it costs, you know, cause I'm giving more value as long as I can, figure out if they need that thing, then I can start, you know, talking about it, but I usually never get into sales mode. So I'm just trying to figure out ways of hacking my brain to like eventually mention whatever it is that I do. I think you've done a pretty good job of selling yourself though, just by being who you are. Um, Thank you. I think that is the best sales advice I've ever heard. Oh, wow. Yeah. So thank you for that. 
I foresee I'd... me teaching that to somebody else in the near future. Because that, that one of my re- one of my secrets to success, success is that if I learn something, I teach it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because why why not share everything you know? Yeah. That's what I'm saying. I, I am always about lifelong learning and uh and I love educating people and like teaching them something that they didn't know that can make their lives better. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Excellent. Okay. This is your moment of gratitude for whom or what are you most grateful? My grandmother, Nana. So she's 92 years old now and she was on my podcast. Uh, She was episode 51. And then I recently released a blooper reel on April 1st of all of our, not all of them because there's so many bloopers, but uh, her and I's conversation was six Zoom calls over a year that I then edited together. So there's plenty of mistakes and uh, ridiculous things. So this year for April Fools, I decided to release some of the wackier moments from that one. Um, but she, I talk to her every Sunday and she's just um, one of the bright beacons of light in my life. Thanks for tuning in to Gratitude Geek, the relationship marketing podcast for solopreneurs building genuine, lasting relationships with clients, colleagues, and community. Make sure to visit gratitudegeek.com for the show notes where you can find links to all the groovy resources we've mentioned, including ways to connect with our guest, Ben Courier. If you love this episode, don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review on Audible, iTunes, Good Pods, or your preferred podcast player so you never miss an episode. Our theme music is Track 14 by Rev Brock and Soul Lily. I'm your host, Candice Rodardi, reminding you that gratitude is like manure. It's just a pile of poo until you spread it around. Stay (laughs) groovy, my friends. Stay groovy, my friends. 